Hello, Senator Warren. So good to see you. How are you? I'm doing great. Listen, anytime I'm with Move On, I'm in I'm in good shape. It's good to see you today, Rada. How are you? Well, I feel the same. I was super excited to be able to chat with you. I know there is a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on in the world. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you're hanging in there. You bet. You bet. Really Great, great, great. Well, our members are super excited about a topic that you have been championing for quite a long time, which is the need to ensure the ultra wealthy pay their fair share in taxes. You think, you know, it's like, to me, this is one of the things, what's happened to us in this democracy that we think that a handful of the richest, 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 richest should be paying less in taxes than public school teachers, than firefighters, than childcare workers, than nurses. I'm just like, how did this happen to us as a country? And of course, I know the answer to this. Money begets money. And it's not just because you can make all these fabulous investments and so on. It's also because it buys political influence. So why is it we can't get tax reforms through Congress that are supported by somewhere between 80 and 90% of the people in this country? And a big part of it is because money talks. Yeah. And which brings me back to why I'm so glad to be here with Move On. And because you're our chance to save democracy. <laughs> well, we'll do it together. I mean, yeah. our millions of members have been really high on this idea since Democrats took control of the House and Senate. They've recognized for way too long that the ultra wealthy are getting away with paying their fair share year after year. And it's they're just galvanizing all this wealth. They're flying to the moon yeah. while people here at home can't afford childcare. Yep. They, can't, they can't afford to put food on their table. I mean, how are we, how are we, how are, how are we going to get out of this? And, and I think a question before we get into, I have a bunch of questions from our members that I want to ask you, sure. but a question is, you know, Democrats have control of the house and Senate, a slim, slim majority, which we've been dancing on for the last year. But technically, we have the power to do something about this. Yep. Can you say a bit about where we are in our ability to actually make that change that the vast majority of Americans have been demanding for so long? So let me talk about two versions of this problem. That is, the basic problem is the powerful twist the levers here in Washington so that they don't pay nearly as much in taxes. And then the consequences are everybody else has to pick up the ticket and there's not enough money left in many cases to be able to make the investments we need to make like universal child care universal pre-k home and community-based care uh doing more in the fight on climate right these these things that cost a lot of money if the guys at the top aren't paying a fair share that either falls on america's working families middle class families or it doesn't get done at all so i think of it as We've got the problem of the, the billionaires, the enormously wealthy, who, because we have a tradition, and that's all it is, it's just been, this is the way the law has been written, of taxing only income and not wealth, they figured out a few years back, they didn't need to have any income. Mm -hmm. So that means Elon Musk, 2018, how much did he pay in taxes? Big round zero. Jeff Bezos, pays less than a public school teacher um, on and on through because they have these enormous fortunes, but they borrow money against their fortunes to finance their trips into outer space or their uh, uh, super duper yachts, yachts that have baby yachts. Uh, they can do all that under the current tax code. That is a problem. And it's a problem we need to fix. And I'm just going to be blunt. The only way we're going to fix this is if we decide to tax wealth. Now, there are a couple of different ways to do it, but that's just the deal. That's what's in front of us. Every time someone says, well, I'm for raising the income tax, doesn't get you there. Jeff Bezos says, have at it, baby. Um, let's go. Mm -hmm. So let me do the other half. 
because that's only half the problem. The other half of these giant corporations, the ones that make billions of dollars in profits, um, Amazon, uh, doing really terrifically. And what do they end up paying in taxes? Zero. Um, uh, Tesla sucked down government subsidies uh, uh, in all the years that it's losing money. Finally, finally makes money in 2021. And how much are they paying in taxes? Last I heard, zero. Exactly. So there's good news and bad news. Let's do the good news first. The good news is on the corporate front. Right now, we have agreement among, listen to this number, all 50 Democrats in the Senate, and we've got our majority in the House, to put a 15% minimum tax on corporations that are making more than a billion dollars in profits. And here's the best part. It's not actually, if it, I love move on because you guys let me get really nerdy. It's not just an alternative minimum tax, which runs the same old problem of incorporating all the tax loopholes. Mm -hmm. This is one that's a tax on your reported book profits. So when you go tell your shareholders, when you tell the SEC that this is how much you made in profits, then you're going to have to write a check for 15% of that. And some people say, well, then they'll start distorting that. Oh, yeah? You think they want to tell their, their shareholders they made less money? Uh, especially because cool. CEO pay yeah. is based on that. So the good news is we get some kind of deal under reconciliation, any kind of deal under reconciliation, this is a key part of the pay for. And, and one little footnote, we also have a 15% minimum tax now among the countries around the world. It's not exactly the same, but it's same direction, cutting out these tax havens all around the world that are costing governments real money. So that's on the corporate side. We're not there yet but real genuine progress. The bad news part of this, I'm telling you, getting the billionaires to just pay something on their wealth, um, you know, all I can say is they squeal like stuck pigs. <laughs> no, 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 you're being unkind, they're being targeted. No, we're just asking for you to pay a fair share and to say you don't get to exploit a tax loophole. So the bad news is we don't even have agreement among 50 Democrats at this point on it, but we've got a lot of public opinion coming our way. We've got a lot of folks, I hope, who are listening today who keep raising their voices on this. We're moving closer. This is an idea that, as you know, three or four years ago, nobody was in this right. space. We're but after, super after, close, and if we get, I mean, just think about the hundreds of thousands of folks watching this, our little chat today. If they make calls, if they write letters to their members of Congress, we have to keep applying that pressure. Yep. And talk to their friends. Yes. This is one of those that the deeper it goes in the population, just across, across the board. Because understand this, what the polling is showing us is this is not just liberal Democrats who like this. This is Democrats across the board, you ready? Independents across the board and Republicans across the board, including some very conservative Republicans. Look, no matter what views you hold on a lot of other things, fair is fair. Yes. And people get it. When the 99% on average every year pays about 7.2% of their total wealth in taxes, and that top one-tenth of 1% 1 is paying about 3.2%, that's less than half, people say, that's not right, nope. just not right. Speaking of people, <laughs> we have a Move On member, Linda A, who wrote to us. She was excited we'll be talking to you, to, uh, we'd be talking today. And she calls our tax laws corrupt. And she says, as part of the shrinking middle class, I am tired of carrying the tax burden for this country while the rich get richer and the corporations pay nothing, which is exactly what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think people are just absolutely fed up and, and they recognize it is the patriotic thing to do to yes. your country. Yes, yeah. yes, 
Exactly right. I am with you all the way, Linda. And we just need several more million Lindas out there to be ready to fight this fight because that's what it's all about. And I, I will say this, I really want you to hear it. You have already made a difference. Mm. This was an idea that was out on the edge when I first started talking about this in 2018. And now it is around these halls. Like I said, we may not have all 50 people signed on yet, but everybody understands it. People a whole lot more are willing to sign on, but the, the wind is blowing in our direction and we just got to put some more wind in our sails. So Linda, you and me, let's be in this one. Yes. Okay. One, another, sure. uh, another question from a member, Carolyn M. Mm -hmm. She's super excited about the investments we could make from a fair tax system. And she says, I really want to see the children of our country being lifted out of poverty yes. and thrive through great early education. So we're wondering if you could share a bit more about the investments that President Biden spoke to possibly last night about within his agenda that could be paid for. What could we do in this country if well, the wealthy paid their fair share? What could this country look like? So I just want to give you an idea. There, some of this is where Biden is and some it's not, but I just, just to give you a little bit about the scope. Mm -hmm. A two cent wealth tax on fortunes above $50 million your first 50 million free and clear, but your 50 millionth and first dollar, right, would be subject to a two cent tax. You know what we could do with two cents on that amount? We could pay for universal childcare for every baby in this country. We could raise the wages of every childcare worker and preschool teacher in America. We could pay for universal preschool for wow. every child in America. We could give every public school in america every title one public school full funding which was always the promise and they never got Ooh. we could give idea all of our children who have uh, uh, disabilities or special needs full funding for that program and think about this we could give a million dollars to every single public school not district school in america and say do something excellent with it. Do something that you need, whether that's um, uh, you need to uh, more microscopes and you really want to build out science or you need more in your cafeteria or you want to hire more reading specialists. Do what helps your children the most. And I'm not through yet. This is still on the same two cents. We can do all of that for our public schools K-12. We could put $50 billion into historically black colleges and universities. Uh, we could cancel $50,000 of student loan debt. <laughs> and here's the thing, do all of that for our kids and still have money left over. I have never heard that broken down that way. Oh. And I will be honest, I got the chills of thinking about what is possible yep. and just my own upbringing in public school and what my school, and my school is great, you know, I, I was oh, in yeah. a district, but like what more could have been possible with that type of funding? What, and the lives of the teachers we know out there and that they just are so undervalued and underappreciated. And, and think about all the ways in which that works. So on the K-12 part, for example, right now we simply know that because our principal funding comes from, uh, from property taxes, the poorer the neighborhood you live in, the more underfunded your schools are. I mean, it's just, it's a correlation. One of the things we could do by putting more federal money in is we could help level that playing field. We could help make sure the Title I schools are all fully funded, that they really have the money and that they really have the facilities. I, I feel like it's a way to say our kids matter to us. Their education matters to us. The people who teach them matter to us. It's about our values. Mm -hmm. And frankly, they matter more to us than the fact 
that the billionaires are out there growing their fortunes by far more than 2% a year. So we're not telling you we're going to keep all your money, take it all away. We're just saying grow it a little slower and make that two cent investment in the kids of our country because they are our future. Yeah. I'm sold. Let's do it. Let's do it. (laughs) Two cents. Another question. Um, Our members keep telling us they can't afford to make student loan payments in May. As we come up on two years of the federal student loan pause, we know these payments are unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about why you um, want, why you, sorry, a little bit about why you want President Biden to pick up his pen and cancel student debt? And I'll just add them with you, but I want to share it with those that are, are watching our chat today. So look, if you have student loan debt, you already know the answer to this. If you love someone who has student loan debt, you already know the answer to this. Education was supposed to be the great equalizer in our country. Everybody has opportunity. You get out there, you apply yourself, you learn a trade, you you master a profession, then you really have a shot at America's middle class. And as we become a more knowledge-driven economy, that education becomes even more critical. But here's the problem. Education is now working to help divide Americans. If you're fortunate enough to be born into a family that can afford to send you to post high school education, usually college, but also technical school, and you can graduate without debt, you begin your adult life here. But if you are born into a family that can't afford to do that, then you end up with a bucket of debt. And for many people, have to pay off the equivalent of a down payment on a mortgage before you can make it to dead flat broke Mm -hmm. and start the the economic uh, uh, adult life. Mm -hmm. And then add one more twist to it. We say to people, get out there and try. Get out there and try, try, see what you can do. And yet, 40% of the people who have student loan debt don't end up with a college degree. God bless them, they tried. And Mm -hmm. stuff happens. They have babies, they were working three jobs and it all crumbled in. Mom got sick, they moved, fill in the blank. Things Mm -hmm. happen that mean that people can't make it on through. Now look where they are. They earn like a high school grad but they're trying to manage student loan debt on top of that, and it is crushing them. And that's where we're hearing stories, a lot of them, about people who borrowed 30 and now owe 80. Wow. Um, That interest compounds, they fall behind, they end up with penalties, and it's just a snowball that has rolled over them and mashed them flat. So that's the personal part. And I I want to pause and draw a line. But even if you don't have student loan debt, even if you don't know anyone who has student loan debt, you still should want to see us cancel student loan debt. And the reason for that is that it's good for our economy. We've seen data now from the Federal Reserve, from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, from the Treasury Department, showing young people are not buying homes. They can't move out of mom's basement at the same numbers and at the same place in their lives. And here's the big one. Can't start small businesses. Think about it. You have a great idea, great idea. And you're willing to have seven roommates and live on ramen noodles for a year to try your idea. Great, unless you have student loan debt. Mm -hmm. So we're watching these divides. Who gets to Who gets to take that chance? Who gets to roll the dice when they're young on starting a business? And the answer is people who are fortunate enough to be born into families that can afford this. And that means we're all paying a price. I don't know how many good ideas didn't make it because the person who had that good idea also had a load of student loan debt and had to take a job where there was gonna be a paycheck coming in every month. 
And that's a real problem for our economy overall. So those are at least two. If you want to talk about the racial wealth gap, that's certainly another one. You tell me how much how much you want to do on this. I'm just I'll ask you one more question on sure. student loans is how close are we? Like, is this, you know, our members have been pushing all year and and asking the administration to consider, like seriously consider canceling and talking about how important it is and how it'll change their lives. How close are we? <laughs> What more do we need to be doing? <laughs> uh, more. Yeah. Louder. Keep it up. Now is the time. Mm -hmm. um, the urgency of the moment is upon us. It's pretty clear that people are not ready for student loan debt to restart in May and pretty clear that we don't need to be doing this. Yeah. So this is the moment. Remember, we just have to persuade one person. Yeah. President of the United States, a man who all his life has said he's there for working families. He believes in opportunity. He wants us to be an America of opportunity. Then now is the time to say it's it's a beautiful day out there, Joe Biden. The sun is shining. It's a great day to cancel student loan debt. We need to keep that pressure up. This is not a legislative agenda issue. He already has the power. How do I know that? because Barack Obama canceled student loan debt, because Donald Trump canceled student loan debt, and because Joe Biden has already canceled student loan debt. We just need him to use it more boldly. So let's stay on it together. We're, we're close. We'll keep doing it. We're, we're okay. We're That's I'm counting on you. <laughs> but it's interesting how this the, the issue of student loan debt intersects with everything else we've yep. been talking about today. I was having dinner with an old friend this weekend. I hadn't seen them in 10 years. And they were telling me how um, they had been laid off uh, mm -hmm. throughout the pandemic. Turns out the head of the corporation that they worked for was you know, running a pyramid scheme. <laughs> so they lost their, their 401k, they lost their day-to-day their, um, their -day salary and they were also a grandparent taking care of their grandkids during the day because their kids can't afford childcare. Yep. And so all of these things are coming together and mm -hmm. a lot of these issues around lowering costs for families, investing in, in um, resources that family needs to, get, needs to need to get by, all of this is part of the president's agenda. Yep. And I know that so many of us have been working day and night around the Build Back Better Act last year. And people are frustrated. What do you say to the millions of volunteers and activists out there that have been doing the work to pass this agenda and we're kind of in this, this stalemate moment? What do you say to folks out there? So I say, don't give up. In fact, it's time to redouble. Mm -hmm. We need to fish or cut bait on what we're going to do in the reconciliation package, which we were calling Build Back Better. OK, I get it. I'm not going to get everything I wanted. Mm -hmm. Damn, uh, I, I want what I want, right? I'm willing to get out there and fight for it, but I get it. That's not going to happen. But here's how I think of this. It's like a it's like a thousand piece puzzle. And we actually have all 50 Democrats agreeing on about 990 of the pieces. OK, let's make a deal out of those and let's get that part done. Because there's so much good stuff in there that not having every piece, we can't look at this as failure. We look at all the pieces we do get and say, there's the success. Mm -hmm. Let's get those pieces done. Let's get universal childcare and universal pre-K and home and community-based care. Far as I keep hearing, all 50 of us are on board for that. Let's make the giant corporations pay uh, at least a 15% minimum tax. I'm hearing a deal right there. Now, let's, we need a few other pieces that we need to get into this. Climate change, obviously. We, we, we are past time to make bigger investments in climate change, but let's do what we can do right now. We've got two reconciliation package opportunities between now and the end of 2022. So let's take what we can in the first one, 
and let's take what we can in a second one and let's fight to get some more Democrats in the United States Senate and to hold on to the House. I mean, it's just that straightforward. Yep. Well, I want to thank you, Senator Warren. You have been an incredible champion for working oh. people, for people all across this country. For You've been a great partner to move on and move on members. We're so grateful for you. And thanks for thanks for finding some time to connect today. Appreciate you it. You bet. Look, I had to drink my tea anyway. Wanted to sit down and have a cup of tea with you. And it's so good to be able to be with you. I'm really serious when I say how much I love to be with you and how much I admire the work that Move On is doing. I spend a lot of time here in Washington and the voices of the billionaires, they echo through these halls. Mm -hmm. Move On and all your members, make their voices heard. You are our chance to build an America that works not just for a handful at the top, but an America that works for everyone. So thank you for all you're doing. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great day. Bye.